time for the Gore and More podcast. <laughs> gonna have a good time. Gonna have a good time. Yeah, we're gonna have a good time. We're going on now. A ball break, ball break. walking hand in hand in the moonlight. And the will be the sweet soul there. I swear we'll never part. We're going on now. A ball break, ball break. running in the sand. What's up, guys, and welcome to the Gormore Podcast. This is your host with the most, TJ Bowser, and joining me today is the talented Michael B. Silver. Hey, how you doing, guys? Thank you for coming on this show, man. I, I really appreciate it. No problem. I'm excited. Uh, so, first question, uh, what inspired you to get into acting and not some other profession? Hmm, great question. So, my family uh, was in the business. My grandfather was a um, was a writer producer in the 30s and 40s and um he made some amazing films including mr smith goes to washington and stuff so i grew up uh really young like going to the regency and the thalia which were old school revival houses in new york city um and my dad uh it was really important that my sister and i had a had a, a strong background and you know understanding film he was just obsessed so i was seeing a lot of movies before i was really ready but um, as a little kid, I, I, I had an amazing education um, in film. And I remember when I was watching uh, Chaplin. I was watching uh, City Lights at like, I don't know, I was like six. And I remember there's this moment at the end where he where he's, you know, he's he's in love with this flower girl and she is blind. And he somehow I can't remember how, but he somehow gets the money to get her the operation. This is like whatever in the 1920s <laughs> gets her the operation to to. Um, you know, to, to regain her sight and she does and it works, but now he's afraid to let her know it's him because he thinks that now that she can see and she's beautiful, that she won't be interested in him. So he, instead of telling her who he is, he buys a flower from her, but she takes his hand while she's exchanging the flower for the money and realizes who he is and loves him, of course. And I remember there was this moment where I was sort of laughing and crying and crying and laughing the way that like Chaplin can make you do. And I was, and I just had this revelation. I was tiny, and I had this revelation of like, that's what I'm going to do. That's that, the feeling that I'm having right now. That's what I want to give to other. That that's that's where I want to live. So uh, that was it for me. I mean, I, you know, I'm still chasing that feeling. That's awesome. <laughs> but uh, but I knew as a little kid, and then and then my sister came out here, and you know, in in the late '80s, and she wrote in um, at film school, she wrote "Hand the Rocks to Cradle." And uh, as her thesis. And so she blew up immediately. And the second I got out of college, I could not wait to get out to L.A. And I thought it was just going to be a, you know, a party. <laughs> I had no clue. <laughs> so were you a fan of the Friday the 13th franchise prior to getting your role in Jason Goes to Hell? The Friday the 13th franchise came out right as I was at the perfect age. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how old I was, but I was, you know, I was like a tween or I was early teens or whatever. And my friends and I were obsessed, and so we would go and see it over and over again. And 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 then as we got older, and the, you know, and more and more sequels started coming out, it became a thing for us. So the fact that it actually that I actually crossed paths with this franchise ultimately as an adult was really exciting because I had been a huge fan since the first one. I mean, I'll never forget watching that first one the first time with my friends and screaming, and we'd never seen anything like it. And all the all the horror movies that came after it were sort of, you know, uh, you know, tried to imitate it because mm -hmm. it was such a thing back then. And we just hadn't seen anything like it, like that, quite that scary. And so, and fun. And, um, so yeah, I was obsessed. What was it like to work with Adam Marcus on Jason goes to hell? Adam was amazing. You know, the truth is, is that, is that I thought I, that, that there, I mean, maybe there will be down the road, but uh, Adam and I really connected beautifully and he was such a warm, fun guy to work with. I was young and I was, you know, somewhat naked and <laughs> didn't really know a lot about what I was doing. And, so, and Adam was really, he felt like, he felt like an uncle or like a, just a big brother. I mean, I, we're probably even the same age, but he just felt like he knew what he, he was in control. He had a vision. He was very clear about it, but he was so warm. And the fact that I was, you know, in a vulnerable state, a physical vulnerable state, as well as, you know, playing a vulnerable state, he was just right there with a, with a warm hand on my shoulder. And he's been, you know, and he's been great ever since he's been a friend ever since. That's awesome. And, and, and by the way, I, what I realized at the end of it was everybody felt that way. Everybody felt like Adam was their big brother or their, it was like, I thought my connection with Adam was special, which it was, but everyone felt the same thing, which just speaks to his, you know, his vision and his warmth and his, you know, 
his ability to create a, a, a warm, loving set, you know, and that's also creative and gets the work done. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Can you talk about your experience filming the tent scene and Jason goes to hell? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not sure how much I, I can divulge here, but uh, obviously I, I, none of us, the, the, as I remember it, the film had been screened and there was a mandate for for a couple for another couple scenes. Yeah. And um, so uh, I was in acting class with Michelle Clooney and Catherine Atwood, who were the two other ladies. Um, and there was a casting director in the in the class as well. And I think his job was to cast these three parts immediately and get us on set within whatever, six hours or whatever the hell it was. And so uh, I think we a, a bunch of us auditioned and. The three of us got it, and I knew both of these ladies really well, and Michelle and I had had been very close. And so all of a sudden there we were thrust into this tent with, like, some smelly grips and, <laughs> you know, and it was freezing on the stage. And, you know, I remember coming out in a bathrobe and and slippers, nothing else, uh-huh. and not knowing what, what, what was going to happen. I think I was 23 or something, and I was just terrified. Um, and Michelle was super sweet, and we had been very close, and, and she was in the same boat. So we kind of hung together. And as I said, Adam really made it a warm thing that even though it, you know, it could have been awkward, he made it feel very, you know, um, I don't know, just very safe. And what I learned was, you know, when you drop that rope and you're like, okay, here we go, it feels incredibly strange. But, you know, an hour and a half later, when you're doing the same thing again and again, and it's the same grips and it's the same everything. You're just like, you just get used to it and your mind just shifts a little bit. And so I stopped being so self-conscious and I started to try and listen a little bit and be present with the scene. But, you know, Michelle's lovely. And so, and she was, and she, and we trusted each other. So I, we, we just tried to hang on to each other and have fun with it and not, not overthink it. You know, the minute you overthink it, you're dead. Yeah. So she and I just clutched to each other and we trusted each other and trusted Adam and we just, we just went for it. That's awesome. So do you have a favorite set story from uh, Jason Goes to Hell? Well, that's it. I mean, oh, okay. I mean, you know, Michelle and I had been super close and I, I don't think either of us knew that we were, that we had both booked it. And so we showed up there and we looked at each other and realized that like, here we go. Um, I remember, you know, Richard Gant who played the Jason at that moment, who was going to, who was going to destroy us. But I guess, you know what? The best memory was this. They made this incredible double of Michelle to sit on top of me while we're, you know, yes. making love. Yes. And it was, they made a few of them at different stages of her demise, mm-hmm. but, um, but they had to rip this thing in half, I guess. And it kind of falls in half and then blood splatters on, on my face. And I've just got to <laughs> scream for, for dear life, right? I'm making love to this person who's now completely mutilated. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's coming after me. And I just remember they were spraying, um, fire extinguishers or what looked like fire extinguishers filled with blood or fake blood <laughs> in my face and adam was like go and i and i was just screaming for, for for dear life and the whole thing was so absurd and so sort of disturbing anyway that the screaming that was going on was coming from a real organic place which was a nice acting lesson for me from that scene in our uh, fan group that i told you about pre-show uh we actually saw some of the kmb effects people post set photos of the of the oh, dummy. no way. I want to see this. Yeah, uh, it looks like a crime scene photo straight up. <laughs> yeah, totally. It was, like, it was really bloody. And there's a uh, a female podcaster in my podcast network, and her new hashtag from your scene is show more wiener. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That's so funny, man. I don't think I've seen it, and I, I think I'm afraid to watch it now that I'm <laughs> Now that I'm actually an adult, it's, uh, you know, I'm afraid to watch uh, exactly how much wiener there is, but, <laughs> uh, but I remember it was a lot of fun. That's great. So you have worked in both film and television, which do you prefer and why? It's another great question. Um, film industry has changed so much in the past, just few years, even the past couple of years. It's, it's amazing how fast the whole industry is changing and shifting and everyone's pouring into TV and TV is becoming something totally different. You know, I just watched uh, Buster Scruggs, which is the new Coen brothers movie and it's on, you know, it's just Netflix. So, so the, the difference between the two has definitely merged a bunch. I think the thing about TV is that you, is that when you're on a thing for, 
you know, I've done a lot of gigging. I've done a lot of been a journeyman and sort of guested on a lot of shows and recurred on a lot of shows. And, and so that's always a challenge to walk onto something that's, that's already moving um, and sort of assimilate quickly and understand the politics and the vibe of the set, which are all very different. And yet knowing your job and standing your ground, you know, I also, I often play guys with a strong point of view who, um, you know, for better or for worse are trying to get something done. And so the, the temptation is to walk on and want to be liked. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I think that I've, that TV is interesting and in that you, you really get an opportunity to sort of, you know, ingratiate yourself and, and, and try and understand how you fit into the larger picture, but also not kowtow to, you know, celebrities and stars and sort of be a strong adversary for them, which is what they want. So that's, so TV is, you know, you get a longer shot of that. You get more, um, you know, you get more, uh, what's the word? You just get more information and more and more stuff from which to create from, and you've got a history. And now it's like, rather than you just coming in and delivering, you know, you've had a few episodes or a few years or whatever to develop relationships and understand your character with film, which of, which of course, as I said, inspired me to be here. And it's what I always thought I'd be doing, you know, primarily, um, you get one shot, you know, you move a lot slower and there's more time to sort of get what you need and ask questions and rehearse often. And if you have a great director, then, you know, there's really some exploration that, that goes on on set, which is really beautiful. And rather than shooting, you know, a, a lot of, you know, 10 pages a day, you're shooting two. So you really get to plumb all of that, but it's, but it happens and then it's done and then it's out and it's on to the next. And so there's really not that, ability to, to come back next week or the next week or the next week and sort of revisit this relationship and let the writers play with, you know, play with growth and, you know, all kinds of fun things. So I don't know if I answered that well, but. Oh, you did. <laughs> um, okay. All right. Great. How are you do, able to require your role in NYPD blue? That's another great question. So, uh, so NYPD blue was my favorite show. I was obsessed with it as was Hill street blues. And, um, and I could, I, and I, and I was desperate to get on it and the casting director, Junie Larry Johnson, who was a fantastic casting director, who's cast so much for so many years and has been so good to me. She kept bringing me in for different parts and, uh, and I wouldn't get it. And literally the 11th audition for NYPD blue. And after the sixth, I was like, look, you know, I don't want to keep doing this if they just don't, if they're not going to cast me. It's just, you know, it's tough. It's, it's a lot of work and you, you know, you get yourself ready and you, and you, you know, you drive to the thing and you walk over and you sit in the waiting room with a bunch of guys and you go in and you pour your heart out and you walk away and you don't get it. And it's just, it's a real heartbreak. And so after a bunch, I was like, I just don't want to do this anymore because they're not casting me and it's, and it just, it's just too hard emotionally. And my guys are like, just keep doing what you're doing. So on the 11th audition for this thing, I read for Leo Cohen, which was a one, a one day guest star, mm -hmm. um, two scenes one day. And that was it. And I remember, and I booked it and I was so excited. And I remember being on set with Jimmy Smith's my first scene and it was going well. And Jimmy and I connected immediately and it was a real adversarial scene. And, you know, I was young, but I was able to stand up to Jimmy who's enormous and gorgeous and talented and has a head as big as a watermelon. And so, so I was, you know, I was terrified, but I stood up to Jimmy and, and held my ground, you know, looked up at him and, Oh my grand. I remember David Milch, who is the genius behind that show, came over and, and said to both of us, we can really use what you're doing on the show. Yes. And he walked away. <laughs> and I didn't quite, I was so involved in what the hell was going on. And I was so young that Jimmy's turned to me and he said, did you see what just happened? And I was like, I, yeah, no. And I mean, I, I don't know what I said, but I didn't get that he was going to write for me for, you know, nine years. I mean, I ended up doing a bunch of the bunch of shows and I learned so much from that place and I was so lucky to, to have had it. But, the, but the lesson is of course, you know, just keep fighting because I thought that they were just putting me through this because they hated me and they wanted to keep <laughs> watching. Me, keep they hated. But they were looking for the right one and the right one came and it was just a really amazing learning experience for me. In reference to NYPD blue, what was your approach to playing Leo Cohen and how that character evolved over the course of the show? Mm. I, I loved Leo Cohen as much as people hated him. And, and you know, I, I, uh, there was a lot of discussion as to as to, you know, whether he was a good guy or a bad guy. And um, I, the thing about Leo Cohen was I, I went and, and traveled with or, or hung out with uh, a young ADA in Los Angeles. And at the time, and he was um, he was in charge of prosecuting police. So he carried a gun and he was very secretive about his, you know, his 
phone numbers and where he lived and everything. He was, he was, uh, he was an intense dude. And I hung out with him and sort of just watched him and learned. And we did, we went to the precincts and the police academy and I went out in the field with him a bit. And he was really helpful in terms of making that world real for me and understanding how it, how it worked and what the, and what the priorities were and the seriousness of the nature of it and, you know, how he got into it. And so I just sort of watched him and listened and kept my mouth shut and I got a lot of stuff out of him. But I remember there was one moment where he was folding, I forget what it was. He had a napkin in his lap or whatever. He's getting up to the bathroom and he folded it meticulously and put it on the table just so and, and walked away. And I realized he was completely OCD and, and fastidious and, you know, very like Felix Ungerish in, in terms of his neatness and everything had to be in order. And for some reason, you know, all the cops, all the, you know, ADA stuff was, was interesting and fascinating and really filled in all the, all the blanks I needed. But his, his need for order and, um, you know, making order out of chaos <laughs> to steal from, you know, Nietzsche, he, uh, was what hooked me. And all of a sudden I remember walking in and I, I had a scarf and, and gloves and stuff. And I just, and in the scene and I was just sort of folding them just right. And, it just worked and the writers picked up on it and all of a sudden Leo Cohen was, was OCD um, or at least, you know, a neat freak. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was really a, a, you know, a hook for me for some reason. It just sort of resonated with me and I, and I, and I got the, I got the bottom of it somehow. And, and they leaned into it as writers and Milch picked up on it immediately, of course, because, you know, genius that he is. And, um, and there, and, you know, it, it, it grew from there. The writing on that show was so smart that, Really, there wasn't a lot that you had to do. I mean, I had to get out of the way, really, and not overthink it. As a young actor, you want to act up a storm, and the writing was so good that you just trust it, and you talk and listen and use those words, and magical things started to happen. What is something that you took away from your time on NYPD Blue? You know, as brilliant as David was, is, sorry, as brilliant as David Milch is, um, there was a little bit of chaos on that set, and... There was, um, you know, uh, there, the scripts weren't coming as quick as the work was happening. So there was a lot of moments where you had to kind of fly by the seat of your pants and grab a script and learn it quick and just go. And um, I learned a lot about being flexible and facile and quick and not getting stuck on things or focusing on what I what I don't know or what I don't have and, and leaning into what I do understand and trusting the writing, you know. The, again, you know, as a, as an actor, you want there's a lot that you want to do, and you want to be great. And I mean, the show meant a lot to me, and I knew it was an exciting moment for me. And so I wanted to do so much, and I learned that I had to sort of lean, you know, let go a little bit and not control everything when my character tried, and um, trust the writing, and just you know absorb the words and open your ears and listen. I mean, it was a lot of listening going on, which which was amazing. I mean. Dennis Franz and Jimmy Smith, who, who I work with a lot, and you know all those guys. They're such an amazing cast, and they're you know I, they're such good listeners. And it never occurred to me as a young actor un, until that moment that it was all about listening. It was all about just trust and listening, and not about how talented I was or thought I was, or you know all the many things I was trying to accomplish when I was there. That I really just had to open my ears and let you know let those fantastic actors and those beautiful words affect me and see what happened trust do you feel you are sometimes typecast in your television roles sure i mean you know i came out here to be tom cruise i think or some sort of you know (laughs) action hero and um i learned very quickly that in that in in the eyes of hollywood or the eyes of america or whatever that that my ethnicity my you know my jude my judaism or my jewish looks or, or whatever kind of guided things i mean throughout the process i've gotten to play a lot of really fun characters and done a lot of you know, different things. And, and so I've broken through that in a lot of ways, but the idea that like, you know, that, that because, that because of how I look that doctor and lawyer and, you know, FBI agent are things that, you know, I mean, I I don't know if it's typecast, but I've certainly played a a lot of different types of lawyers and types of doctors and stuff. (laughs) That was a little bit of a surprise to me. I wouldn't say I've been typecast because, because, every job is different and I played a lot of really fun guys, but, um, but it was a shock to me that like, Oh yeah, I'm not going to be running on a roof with a gun. I'm going to be <laughs> you know, with a briefcase or a stethoscope walking into an office. Um, that was a little bit of an expectation adjustment, 
but uh, you know, I was happy to be working. And again, you know, if I'm on NYPD blue doing that stuff or at the same time I was doing uh, ER, which was a huge show at the time. And I was playing a child psychologist on that. And, um, though it wasn't exactly what I pictured, it, it was perfect. And it's, you know, and it's led me to this and hopefully there's more, you know, more to come. Hell yeah. So how did you get involved with the series instinct? So, so my best friend since I was four years old is Michael Rauch. Oh, wow. And he's, he's an incredibly talented writer, producer, and has been making shows for a long time. And we grew up making films together and our families were best friends. And he's godfather to my kid and I'm the godfather to his kids. And so Rauch and I are, you know, we're like brothers growing up. And he, um, he had made a bunch of shows that I had been on, including World Pains, which I did a bunch of. And he let me direct one and, and, um, he's been a great friend. And so he made instinct and, um, you know, we talked for a bit about, about Cantor Harris and where that was going and stuff. And I think in the, in the, uh, in the execution of it, you know, the, uh, it became a, it became a, a slightly different animal. And so Cantor Harris, you know, slid into the background a little bit, but, um, Michael Roush, you know, took care of me and sort of loved what I, what, you know, what we came up with for this guy. And, um, you know, it was a blast. It's always a blast working with him. He runs an amazing show. He's an incredible boss and a great writer. And, you know, everybody, everybody loves working for him. It, you know, he, he's really has the ability to make a family. And so whether it was Royal Pains or Beautiful People or Love Monkey um, or Instinct, like there's always a there's always a family that, you know, that exists often the same faces, by the way, for each show. I mean, he's very loyal to all the people that, that work for him. And um, it's really, you know, it, it was a beautiful environment and I was really, really proud to be a part of it. When it comes to your role in instinct, what makes that different than other series you have worked on? You know, I guess the, the, the people involved, as I said, I mean, Alan uh, is incredible and Boyana, but you know, everybody around there that, you know, the family that was created was really warm. And so, uh, I don't know. I wish that there was more seasons of instinct because I felt like we were kind of getting into, you know, Cantor Harris and the pilot. Um, is hitting on Boyana's character, Lizzie, and um, and she knees him in the balls, and he, <laughs> you know, so there was sort of that vibe in the pilot, and then of course the series was made months and months later, and there were notes from network and all kinds of other, you know, uh, concerns or you know ideas or whatever, and Alan's character evolved, and everybody started to change, and so I'm not sure that Harris really. You know, Harris took a U-turn a little bit and became kind of a more of a father figure to Lizzie and a friend um, or maybe a punching bag at times. Um, uh, you know, he, he he he's the sergeant. And so he's the boss of the of the precinct on some level, certainly the boss of these detectives. And, I'm, and uh, you know, I would have loved to have had more time to explore that because we never really got there. But I think in the beginning, when you're trying to establish a foothold and grow an audience, I think you got to lean into you know, the exciting, sexy parts of the show, which were, you know, Alan's character and Naveen's character. You know, they certainly wanted to explore Alan's home life and his relationship, um, which was, you know, really well done by, by another great actor. And so, uh, you know, Harris lost a little bit of his uniqueness, I think, because it was a large show. But, um, you know, but I always loved that he was, you know, involved and cared about these guys. And he was sort of a father figure or, or a big brother figure or whatever to the to the detectives final question as an actor what do you consider a strength that you bring to each role these are all really good questions dude <laughs> um you know in terms of listening and and what i talked about about my pity blue i mean that lesson really stayed with me and i find that the impulse is to want to want to walk on and sort of um either prove something or you know or show how great you can do a moment or show something that's important to you that you've been working on and thinking about. And, you know, you spend a lot of time as an actor, like thinking and working in private, and then you get out there and you want to go, go, go. And I think one of the things that I've gotten better and better at is as I age is um, not trying to do as much as trying to receive, trying to find out what, what is, you know, the second you get there and you look across the, across the set and you see your scene partner, seen partners and you realize oh yeah this isn't just the dance that i'm going to be doing this is like part of a larger thing um the ability to receive and to listen well while it's actually going on and let go of what you had planned and take take the leap and find out how the scene's supposed to go find out um what how your character wants to do this rather than 
manage it and manipulate it while it's happening. You know, you look at, at I look at my favorite actors, the people who inspired me, and there's always an unpredictability. There's always a feeling that this is really happening for the first time. And the only way to really get there, I think, is to allow what's happening in that moment right then to really affect you. And so I, I, I don't think I'm perfect at it at all. I think there are so many people who are better at it, who I, who I admire. But I think the ability to really listen and open up your heart and allow someone to really affect you rather than managing how you want to play a moment or a scene, um, I think I'm getting better and better at that. And so I think that's it. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the Gore Moore podcast and uh, thank you for your time. Dude, thank you so much. I had, I had a lot of fun and, uh, and, you know, I can't wait to keep listening. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, All right. this is your host with the most, TJ Bowser, signing off. Ah! 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 Ah!